gaming can harbor some of the darkest secrets. Within those millions of lines of code could be a dark, foreboding, or ominous secret. These secrets can be whatever the developer decides to hide away from the surface level of their game. Sometimes those secrets relate to something in the real world. Even greater gaming mysteries can be found online. The internet is the greatest spreader of stories that we've ever seen. A simple campfire tale can now spread between millions of people in a matter of seconds. The internet is also the place where people share the gaming secrets they've uncovered. Pale Luna is a creepypasta that you've probably heard of before. Even if you somehow haven't, there are a multitude of creepypastas that took inspiration from the story, and you might have heard of one of those. Two in particular that come to mind are Sonic 3 Hacked and My Buddy Sandman. Each of these stories tells its own take on a game hiding something sinister within its files. In My Buddy Sandman, a college student recounts his time with a friend nicknamed Sandman. Sandman was helping some indie developers at his college to create a video game called Warlock. It was supposed to be a text-based adventure game with basic graphics that could be run from a floppy disk. Since this story is set in the early 90s, this all makes sense. The technique they were using for the imagery was digitizing real photos. The person who was digitizing these photos was Sandman, as the others would just provide him with them. This was done to give the game a realistic feel to the fake violence. When the narrator of the story got his hands on the game, he immediately set forth to see what had gotten his friend Sandman so hyped. The game was simple, and very much like other text adventure games at the time. The images looked a bit off with the digitizing, but you could easily tell what you were looking at. It was rather disappointing though, as this was hyped up to be the next great adventure game by Sandman. A little way into the game, the narrator started to see grotesque images. The first was of a person whose face was bloody and mangled. The images would get progressively worse with pictures of women tied up. Provocative photos were also all over the place. The narrator had decided this was to get an adult-only audience most likely, draw them in with violence and nudity. The images reminded the narrator of slasher movies, but not one he'd actually seen before. They all looked so low quality with the digitizing that it was really hard to tell. After completing the game, he was met with an image of a dead animal of some kind, and then his prize of another pixelated woman beckoning him. The game was pretty short and not all that interesting. The most interesting part was the gory and lewd images. Those images, it turned out, weren't from some horror movie or magazine. The creators, not Sandman, had created these photos themselves. They wanted to create a very realistic feel for the game, so they kidnapped women, injured them, and then proceeded to take photos, all in the name of their art, but that just seemed like a cover story for the group. This game would never see the light of day, and the men who created it were served varying sentences. Sandman, on the other hand, was never seen again. He disappeared into the night after how terrible he felt taking part in the game. My Buddy Sandman is a story very much inspired by the ideas put forth by Pale Luna. It was about a game hiding some truly heinous secrets. These heinous acts were conducted by the very people who would create the game. This story has that feeling like it could happen, a sort of realism that made the story stand out in a sea of haunted video games. Pale Luna is a story that rides the same line between something that could happen in a clear internet campfire story. The story isn't very long. It could easily be posted in a single YouTube comment. The easy to spread nature of the story made it excellent for an early creepypasta. The story pulls you in, gives you all the information to get you hooked, and then ends with some questions that you'll never get answered. A perfect early internet creepypasta. And one that will easily stick with those that read it. The history of Pale Luna is a trend that you've seen before especially if you've seen my other creepypasta deep dives. The first time Pale Luna was seen on the internet was when it was posted on the Something Awful forums in 2011. It was described as a piece of microfiction, but was mostly overlooked in the thread that it was posted on. It would later be posted to the creepypasta wiki, which is where it gained a lot more traction. The wiki states that the author's name is Mikhail Honradis. The creepypasta wiki is where I first found the story back in 2012. The story from the moment I finished reading it captivated me. It drew me in so much that I spread it to as many people as I could, dropping it in group chats, sending it to friends, and I even did my own retelling while on a trip and asked to tell a campfire horror story. 
It wasn't just me that was captivated. The creepypasta community, and especially the gaming creepypasta community, loved the story. It was a good story, and a sea of stories that were all starting to sound the same. This story would receive praise and be compared to other stories that had captivated the community like Killswitch and even Ben Drowned. The idea behind this story was very simple and that goes a long way in creating a captivating piece of internet horror. With that piece of history out of the way, let's deep dive into the lore of Pale Luna, the internet's first text adventure horror story. Pale Luna is a creepypasta that needs a bit of understanding of the place and time it was set for it to truly be digested. Pale Luna is a story set in the 80s, in the early days of computer gaming, the 70s and 80s. The types of games available to play were rather limited. The earliest computer game genre that was widely accepted was that of the text adventure game. Text adventure games are exactly as their name implies. Games with a story and gameplay are all experienced through text and text prompts. In order for a player to do anything in these games, they would need to type a command into a text box. Only then would a character actually do anything. That means if you wanted to pick up an item, examine a piece of equipment, or even open a door, you have to type in a command like, open door, go east, or use item. These commands weren't universal, but a large majority of text adventure games use commands just like these. The ease at which these games could be created, with just a basic understanding of coding, made them an easy starter genre for a lot of game developers as well. The ease of creation is also important to the story, but we'll get to that part later. First, let's look at exactly how text adventure games got started. Text adventure games were typically based on Dungeons & Dragons, Lord of the Rings, and other fantasy worlds. With this in mind, there were games that tried to break off from this norm. The first ever horror text adventure game was called Mystery House. It was released in 1980 and followed all the usual text adventure game tropes. An unnamed character, you, would search a house to figure out who the murderer inside was. You then had to escape the house without being murdered yourself. The game was considered a huge success for the time, selling 10,000 copies through mail order and 80,000 in its lifetime. This is important as it showed a market for other kinds of text adventure games, other than fantasy and adventure that is. This led to an influx of people creating their own video games. Text adventure was one of the first genres to really get indie developers on board. Anyone could learn how to create a text adventure game, with enough patience, understanding, and creativity. The only downside was distribution. An indie dev would be lucky to even meet a game distributor at the time. That's where shareware meetups come in. Shareware conventions were meetups where like-minded individuals would come together to share copies of their games with others. Indie devs would bring copies of their games, or demos of their games, in the hopes that others would like it enough to share with their friends, family, and coworkers. These meetups were also a great way to meet a distributor, who would likely want to find the next big game to sell. The individuals who attended these meetups would eventually form shareware communities, where some of the largest computer games would rise from. Games like Zork, King's Quest, and Doom. These were all shareware games that had been traded around the community before becoming larger-than-life titles. The developers of these games and more really wanted to start to build a reputation through sharing their games. This is where the story of Pale Luna truly begins. Pale Luna was a game that was supposedly traded around shareware meetups in the 80s. Specifically, it was traded in the San Francisco Bay Area and wasn't seen much outside of the city. The game was created on a floppy disk, like so many of the other titles listed above. The floppy disk was placed in a sleeve with the words Pale Luna written on it. This was common as most indie devs didn't want to or couldn't create elaborate artwork for their games. Later released versions of their games usually would have artwork though. Pale Luna being traded in the 80s and only in San Francisco would make the game nearly impossible to get a copy of today. Technology has moved past games like Pale Luna, which even at the time was a genre that was being left behind for more graphically impressive and technical games. Most people weren't making basic text adventure games at this time. These weren't the only reason for Pale Luna's lack of success and legacy though. There was also the awful game design that made the game hard to play, but we'll get to that later. Here's the description of Pale Luna from the Creepypasta. Pale Luna was a text adventure game in the vein of Zork and the Lurking Horror, at a time when said genre was swiftly going out of fashion. Upon booting the program, the player was presented with a screen almost completely blank except for the text. You are in a dark room. Moonlight shines through the window. 
There is gold in the corner, along with a shovel and a rope. There's a door to the east. Command. So began the game that one writer for a long out of print fanzine decried as enigmatic, nonsensical, and completely unplayable. As the only commands that the game would accept were pick up gold, pick up shovel, pick up rope, open door, and go east. The player was soon presented with the following. Reap your reward. Pale Luna smiles at you. You are in a forest. There are paths to the north, west, and east. Command. This is where the game started to infuriate those that had tried to play it. The game seemed buggy or maybe it was a deliberate design choice by the dev. Either way, it was something that turned players away from the game immediately. The thing is, if you made a wrong move in the game, it would turn off. Not just the game would shut off though, but it would turn off your whole computer too. This made the game insanely difficult to get through, and there didn't seem to be much of a reward or at least one anyone could see. The real issue people at the time discussed was whether this was intentional or not. Considering game difficulty at the time was making the player start over after they died, this seemed like a purposeful decision. Now imagine you're playing Elden Ring, and every time you die, the console or PC shuts off. You have to reboot the system, then turn off the game, and face that enemy that killed you again. How about another example? You were playing Sonic 2 and accidentally plummet into a hole since you were moving at max speed and took a leap of faith. The console shuts off and so does your TV. It would be really hard to come back to a game that had you completely restart with one incorrect button prompt. This is exactly what players were reporting about the game's difficulty and non-intuitive design. This design choice is what really drove away players. Everyone that reportedly tried the game got as far as the second screen before shutting it off and retiring it to a box or trash can. Even if you made it to the next screen, all you'd be met with were the same commands as the one before. It made the adventuring part of the text adventure seem illogical and uninteresting. This also added to the reason for this game being forgotten by most that played it. Even with all this in mind, in every hobby there's always at least one person who will persevere to see what secrets or treasures may be hidden at the end of the trail. Almost every game ever invented has a speedrunner, a completionist, or a person that just can't rest at night knowing that they haven't completed the tasks set out before them. In this case, we have a man named Michael Nevins. Michael is the sort of guy that I mentioned above. He wanted to see whatever Pale Luna was hiding under its obtuse gameplay and repetitive text. For him, there appeared to be something interesting hiding just beyond the blank wall of text. Whatever it was, he was going to see it through to the end, maybe at least to say that he did. The creepypasta doesn't state exactly what Michael is after here, or what he expects to find. Maybe he thought it might lead to a more interesting game. There have been games that hide their true nature behind a rough first barrier. Or maybe he just wanted to be rewarded for seeing it through to the end, to explore the game that no one else had bothered to finish. Or perhaps he thought it would lead to a real world treasure. Very rarely have games hidden treasures in the real world that connect to the game in some way, but it has happened before. This was the case with a game called Trials Evolution. Trials Evolution had signs in the background that when combined just looked like jumbled text. Using a cipher, players were able to figure out it was referring to a series of button presses. Once inputted, a song would play in the background, one that isn't normally heard in the game. The song would then give you the next part of the riddle. This led to other secrets that needed to be uncovered in the real world. Eventually, four keys were found that are supposed to open a box somewhere in the real world. There's more to the ARG than that, but it's not the main focus of the video. It just supports the point of possible treasures being hidden inside games. A few other games have also offered real world prizes like Pymania. The game had a series of cryptic clues that led to a sundial worth 6,000 pounds, the equivalent of 24,940 pounds today. This prize could be obtained only at a certain time of the day in a certain part of the world. The winners had to show up in person to receive their prize from a person dressed like the character from the game. It is possible that the thought of a tangible reward could have raced through Michael's mind, or maybe it was more simple than that. There are people who can't let something rest once it's been started. And so he started the hours of trial and error required to complete this task. The time needed would be even longer with the computer shutting itself off with each incorrect decision made. Even so, he decided he was going to see this game through to its conclusion, if it even had one. 
there's always the chance that there was no right decisions and the game was simply poorly made and not ready for anyone to actually play. Michael toiled away for five hours of the game, hoping his PC wouldn't brick from the number of abrupt restarts. 33 screens later, and a new text box finally appeared. Pale Luna smiles wide. There are no paths. Pale Luna smiles wide. The ground is soft. Pale Luna smiles wide. Here. Command? It was another hour still before Nevin stumbled upon the proper combination of phrases to make the game progress any further. Dig hole, drop gold, then fill hole. This caused the screen to display, congratulations. Michael had done it. He'd found the ending that had eluded him for the last six hours. His reward was somewhat odd though. On his screen were a set of coordinates. This might be the strangest reward anyone has ever gotten for completing a game. Where the coordinates led was another question that perturbed and bewildered him. The phrasing here is odd as well. Pale Luna smiles wide. It's only at this point that we need to consider what Pale Luna could even mean. Was it a person's name or a reference to the moon? Pale Luna was the name of the game, but what could it mean beyond that? Michael didn't ponder this much as he decided to track the coordinates. They pointed to a location in Lassen Volcanic Park, which luckily for him, wasn't too far from where he lived. So he grabbed a map, a compass, and a shovel, and set out to see the true ending that Pale Luna had in store for him. Starting from the location given, he began to explore the wilderness. Careful not to get lost. Here's the excerpt from the ending of the story. He navigated the park's trails, noting with amusement how each turn he made corresponded roughly to those that he took in-game. Though he initially regretted bringing the cumbersome digging tool on a mere hunch, the past similarities all but confirmed his suspicions that the journey would end with him face to face with an eccentric spurred treasure. Out of breath after a tricky struggle to the coordinates, he was pleasantly surprised by a literal stumble upon a patch of uneven dirt. Shoveling as excitedly as he was, it would be an understatement to say that he was taken back when his heavy strokes unearthed the badly decomposing head of a blonde haired little girl. Nevins promptly reported the situation to the authorities. The girl was identified as Karen Paulson, 11, reported as missing to the San Diego Police Department a year and a half prior. Efforts were made to track down the programmer of Pale Luna, but the nearly anonymous legal gray area in which the software swapping community operated inescapably led to many dead ends. Collectors have been known to offer upwards of six figures for an authentic copy of the game. The rest of Karen's body was never found. Michael wasn't rewarded with gold for his long and arduous journey. Instead, what he found will forever haunt his waking life and his nightmares. His reward was the discovery of a grisly murder and the victim of a horrendous act. That's the ending of Pale Luna, and it leaves everyone wondering who, what, when, where, and most importantly, why. The story doesn't go to great lengths to even begin to answer any of our burning questions. That's fine, I think there's plenty of incidental evidence to begin researching from here. First, we have to look at the time period and location of the story. The 80s were no stranger to serial killers, with most of the most infamous ones starting or ending their crimes in that time period. In San Francisco alone, you had the likes of the Unabomber, the Golden State Killer, the Santa Rosa Hitchhiker Killer, and the most infamous of all, the Zodiac Killer. Is it so far-fetched that a man like the Zodiac Killer, or someone inspired by him, could kill someone, hide their body in a national park, and then make a video game-like puzzle for others to solve. It almost seems like something a deranged person would do. The Zodiac Killer was only linked to murders that took place in the late 60s. This doesn't mean that someone couldn't have looked to copycat his puzzles, but in a different way. It is entirely possible someone could make a video game as a puzzle, make it so hard that no one could figure it out, and then proceed to distribute it in a confined area like San Francisco. Let's examine the story a little closer before continuing down that particular thread. The beginning of the creepypasta discusses how these games were traded. These shareware meetups could have thousands of individuals trading games with one another. This would make it easy for someone to slip in, trade a few hundred copies, and never be seen again. Especially since nothing like this has ever happened before. It would be easy for someone to slip into a crowd of people and act like someone new to the community. I believe the San Francisco Bay Area was chosen for this story for many reasons. One, it likely had a large scene of game developers swapping games, 
and two was the number of serial killers that have been active historically in the area. San Francisco and the Bay Area as a whole are rather large and it could be easy for these individuals to move in and commit their crimes. These three factors alone make it an ideal spot for someone to commit such a crime and then self-report in a way. The game is a text adventure game, a genre that was dying at the time this was set, but it was also a game format that just about anyone could make a game in. This would mean that the killer only needed to learn enough to make the game playable so that someone would eventually find their crime. Making the game infuriating also makes it so only the most dedicated player would find the reward. When the game starts, it immediately places the player in a room, a room that was never found while exploring the park. You have a rope, a shovel, and some gold. If you try to use the rope, the game claims it has already been used, which is obvious now based on the context clues. The shovel is also to be used to cover the body and gives you the same message if typed in. Finally, we have the gold. This last piece is most likely not referring to actual gold, and instead referring to the hair of Karen. She was described as having blonde hair, which can be compared to gold. It probably was considered gold in the mind of the killer. A thought I had was whether the game was reenacting the hiding of her body, the gold could just be Karen, the rope is what she's tied with, and the path that you take leads you directly to where she was buried. What if she was being buried during the game? The game was forcing the player to relive the awful atrocity that the killer had committed. It could also be the murderer just giving instructions to where to find the girl. So instead of forcing the player to reenact the hiding of the body, it has you going back to discover it, which you would then mimic in real life to complete the game. A later section of the story confirms that the game is having you reenact the hiding of the body. At the end of the game, you use the shovel to drop in the gold, then bury it. This is definitely the killer making you commit the same crime he just did. This also would be the reward you'd get for completing the killer's puzzle and seeing it through to the end. The game is showing you exactly where part of the body was hidden, with no mention of where the rest of it might be. The final question we're left with is what does Pale Luna actually mean? My first thought was that Pale Luna was referring to the moon and that the crime was committed during the night and possibly during a crescent moon that could look like a smile. It could also be the look of the skull that was buried underground, as just the bones of it could create a disturbing illusion of a smile. Pale could refer to the color of her body after her life had been taken. Pale Luna could also mean nothing, just a name decided upon by the killer, or it could even be the name of the killer, as he smiles, while getting away with his dark deed. This creepypasta was very popular in the community, but was one of the few stories that circulated outside of it as well. People seem to really enjoy the blast from the past of the story setup. It makes it feel like a story that came from a bygone era of mysteries and gaming, one where you could easily create a game, share it, and no one would know who even made it or what they hid within. Games have lost a bit of that mystery moving forward. Everything about any video game can now be accessed via the internet. But in the early days of gaming, that was the furthest from the truth. Picking up a game, especially in the manner in which this game was obtained, left the player with absolutely no idea what they were getting into. If you wanted to figure out what a game had to offer, you had to play it all the way through. That mystery, plus the premise of the game, intrigued readers and made the story pretty popular. Popular enough for a few fan games and even fan films. There are at least two fan films that recreate the story of Pale Luna. The aforementioned fan game also exists and recreates the game exactly as it was described. The first fan film is simply titled Pale Luna and was created by Daryl Hedrika. The film has changed a bit from the original story. Firstly, we follow an older gentleman, rather than the younger Michael. This man's name is never mentioned in the story, and the only real backstory we get is that he received a copy of Pale Luna back when he was in college in the 80s. The old man finds a copy of the game in a box on his shelf. He feels a sudden need to play it, as he wasn't able to complete it when he first played it. The story recreates the shareware meetup and shows how he got the game from a table that had the games just left on it. The man finds his old computer, puts the game in, and we're treated to some familiar text. This is where the story starts to follow the same beats as the original. The man continues playing the game, taking notes, and trying his best to complete it. When he finally gets to the end, he gets some more familiar text. Pale Luna smiles wide, congratulations, and then coordinates are dropped. He writes them down and grabs his stuff, and heads out. Of course he finds the spot in a forest and starts digging. 
It doesn't take long until he finds the skull. Considering how long it took him to find the body, there's nothing but bones left. He calls the police, and they come and take the skull away. The man goes home defeated. He puts the game back into his computer and notices something horrifying. Pale Luna goes across the screen. Then Pale Mary. Pale Sarah. Pale Chris. Pale Anna. And Pale Lisa. This wasn't a single case, and instead a collection of killings by a serial killer. The fan film was pretty standard up until this part. The story changing from a younger to an older protagonist makes sense. Finding a game that you remember vaguely from the 80s, then playing it through for nostalgic reasons seems like a good adaptation. The ending is really the selling point of this fan film though. The ending also leans heavily into another topic I'll be discussing later. The most important question we're left with here is could this happen? Could a video game be hiding such an enormous secret that no one has ever found before? Well, video games have been hiding secrets from us since the 80s. These secrets are referred to as Easter eggs, and the first ever Easter egg was hidden in a game called Adventure for the Atari 2600. Since then, devs have been hiding all sorts of secrets in their games. Most of these Easter eggs are just nods to other franchises, works, or an inside joke by the developers, but that doesn't mean that they aren't real-world mysteries and horrors mixed in as well. Games like GTA have hundreds of mysteries that are never really explained to players. One of the most interesting ones is the Infinity Killer in GTA V. The actual name of the Infinity Killer is Merle Abrams, and he is an Easter egg that can be found in GTA V. Abrams killed eight people after going mad in 1989. The article that you can find says that he took the lives of eight male joggers. Abrams was obsessed with the letter 8 and the infinity symbol, which is where he gets his name. Those eight bodies can be found in the game, in the water covered in plastic. Of note is the actual bodies in the game appear to be female and all of them have the number 8 carved into them. This easter egg shows the darkness that can be hidden in any game. This of course isn't connected to a real serial killer. A AAA game couldn't just flaunt that they know the locations of dead bodies. Of course, that isn't to say that some indie dev out there couldn't hide a secret that leads to something sinister in the real world. In The Crew, an open world racing driving game, there is a dark easter egg hidden in the woods of the southern portion of the map. The map in The Crew is based on the United States, but is much smaller in scale. If you go into the woods, you'll come across a parked car. Near the car is a dead body. Near the dead body is a newspaper with a headline that reads, World Ending. It can be assumed that this person took the headline to heart, but it's hard to say exactly what happened. This game's map is based on the US, as I had mentioned before, and this spot can probably be found in the real world. It's unlikely that a dead body is sitting at this location though, but there's always a chance that another game could make this a reality. Millions of games are posted to the internet every day, some with secrets just waiting to be uncovered. Is it possible that one of these games is hiding a secret as Saphira's Pale Luna? We would have no way of knowing without finding the secret for ourselves. Indie game devs create some of the most unique experiences in the gaming industry. Something could be hidden so well that it could take gamers years to uncover, especially with the aforementioned number of games being uploaded to the internet. Something I'm going to reiterate is the setting of the story. The story was set in the San Francisco Bay Area in the 80s. The 80s were a time rife with serial killers and random acts of violence. The most mysterious and infamous serial killer in that area was the Zodiac Killer. The Zodiac Killer is still not known to this day, but what is known is his cryptic way of telling authorities about his crimes. The Zodiac Killer would leave cryptic clues that included sending letters to police departments. Clues were mostly him gloating and also were supposed to lead investigators directly to him. His crimes took place in the late 60s, but some believed he was still active in the late 80s. Pale Luna does something similar in its story. The murderer in the story creates a game that's like a puzzle. The game is then traded with others in an anonymous fashion. The game then runs you through where the murder took place. This is the murderer gloating and hoping that someone can crack their code. Pale Luna never had a follow-up game released, so it just led to a head. The body never being recovered was likely another puzzle meant to be solved by law enforcement. This feels vaguely similar, but not close enough to really make a connection between the two. It is something still worth noting, as it might have inspired the story. The victim in the story, Karen, would have also likely appeared on milk cartons as a missing person. This was a way of spreading awareness about missing children that started in the 80s. Karen was likely based on all the real-world disappearances of children in the 80s. 
Horror is often inspired by the world we all inhabit, as nothing is more terrifying than reality. Game developers have often hidden dead bodies throughout their worlds. Could any of those belong to real people or be inspired by real events? There are too many games to sift through to find an answer to that question. There was, however, one game that was found to be harboring a dark and sinister secret. That game is pretty well known at this point, but it bears mentioning the sinister past of Sad Satan. Sad Satan was a game that was boasted as the first horror game released via the deep web. It was kind of an anomaly when it was first released. Many different players remembered the game for its garish visuals and trippy imagery, but it would be remembered for something far worse later. It was first seen via a YouTube channel called Obscure Horror Corner. The game has some real scenes and imagery that can't be mentioned in this video for demonetization reasons. Just know this game hid some of the grossest things imaginable. This was all hidden in an indie game that everyone had access to. The main horror of Pale Luna comes in the ending, where the head is discovered. What if a game could lead you to a dead body or something else sinister? While not quite a game, a mobile phone app has done one such thing. Randonautica was an app released for mobile devices in 2020. The app boasts over 10.8 million users as of July 2020, with that number likely being higher now. Randonautica acts like a game in a way. The user will decide what kind of place they are looking for, an attractor, a void, or an anomaly. Once this has been chosen, the app will place random coordinates in your local area for you to explore. The idea is to break you out of your routine and get you exploring new areas. You then tell the app about the experience you just had. Now this has led to some rather traumatic experiences. Users have reported finding creepy or disturbing things while exploring the locations given to them. The app almost seems to be aware that the areas you are being sent to could hold some dark secrets for you to find. In this regard, Randonautica was gaining a reputation as a game that could lead you to your own creepypasta. Nothing reported though compares to the finds of some TikTok users. A group of teens in Seattle were using the app and were sent to a location along the beach. The group came upon a suitcase on the rocks near the beach. The group reported smelling a foul odor before deciding to open the suitcase. The smell of the suitcase got worse until it was unbearable as the group opened it. Inside they found human remains. They immediately called the police following their finding. This to this date is the darkest finding ever to be discovered while using the Randonautica app. Randonautica may not be a game, but it gives users a quest to follow in a similar vein to Pale Luna. The end result of this particular find was traumatic. This has led to many other users describing their dark finding while using the app. Pale Luna stands as one of the greatest gaming creepypastas of all time. It tells a grounded story that has a sense of reality to it. Of the thousands of indie games that litter the internet, there's always a chance that one is hiding a secret that is too evil for this world. Pale Luna lives on as a perfect creepypasta for telling around the campfire or something you send to your friend who doesn't know about the dark side of the internet yet. It will forever live on in my memory as the story that truly brought creepypastas to the forefront of my mind. It opened up the world of internet horror for me. I hope it does the same for you. The internet may hide some of the darkest secrets waiting to be discovered. All you have to do to find them is dig a little. Thank you everyone for watching my video on Pale Luna. Pale Luna is easily one of my favorite gaming creepypastas, and it predates most of the others. A true sounding tale that, if unaware, some might think actually happened. It's a story that leaves you wondering what happened and who was behind the game. I want to thank my Patreon supporters, Blow a Nose, Nora Kingsley, and Scout with a Name. If you want to help support my channel, link to my Patreon is in the description box below. I have a new series on there where I read and review some of my favorite creepypastas, no sleep stories, and internet urban legends. Two new videos drop there weekly. Thank you to everyone who watches my videos, and I hope you all have a good night.